uh, to hearing from. I want to introduce Professor Lada just a bit. Um, Professor Lada is a faculty member at in the city and regional planning section of the Ohio State University School of Architecture. Uh, his areas of focus include sustainable urban design, Latino urbanism, community development, and the social cultural factors which influence planning and design. And I think uh, we're gonna learn more about all that as we hear from Dr. Lada today. As Alex already showed you the book, he is the author of Latino Placemaking and Planning, Cultural Resiliency and Strategies for Reurbanization. Love those words, uh, resiliency and reurbanization. Uh, Professor Lada holds a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture from the California State Polytechnic University, a master's in both urban planning and landscape architecture from the University of Southern California, and a PhD in environmental design and planning from Arizona State University. So just an impeccable background of experience and uh, uh, education uh, in, in Dr. Lada's background. Now you can read more about Dr. Lada's um, uh, uh, career and education in the bio that was uh, included with the uh, webinar announcement. But suffice it for me to say that we are just extremely uh, fortunate to have Dr. Lotta with us today to share about his passion and his expertise on these important topics, which certainly are germane to the Northwest Arkansas region and our communities. And uh, just thrilled that we uh, have a chance to hear from him today. Alex, Helen, and I had a chance to visit with Dr. Lotta just briefly yesterday and looking forward to more information today. Professor Lada, welcome to Northwest Arkansas, uh, even if just virtually for now. And uh, we look forward to having you here uh, sometime in person to visit with us. I've also asked Dr. Lada to share with us some of his why, as we say here, and that is, you know, why this book, why this research? We'd love to hear not only the information from Dr. Lada today, but also some of uh, the passion and heart that he brings to this whole area of focus. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Lada. We look forward to hearing your presentation and then the opportunity to ask you some questions uh, once we get uh, toward the end of the program. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And I thank everyone for the opportunity to be part of this webinar series and share some of my background and research on Latino urbanism. Let me see if I can share the screen here first. It's a little bit slow here, the computer, not, I mean, the network, but. Can you, I'm sorry. I'm having troubles connecting to the presentation here, just a minute. Yeah, we'll, we'll be patient, uh, Professor Lada, as we get this teed up. And um, technology is a wonderful thing when it all works wonderfully, it can also be a challenge. So we all understand that. Professor Lara, it is yes. showing up and it looks really good. Okay, perfect. I was looking at my blank screen. Thank you very much. So, so the first question that you asked me, Alex, is why did I write this book? Just to give you an overview. The main reason I wrote this book that's because I'm an immigrant myself. I'm, I'm originally from Guadalajara, Mexico, and my family moved to Southern California when I was a teenager. So naturally became 
attracted to one of the some of the aspects of Latin urbanism and sustainable urbanism and placemaking. So as I started my academic career, I gravitated towards those two areas of research. So and I thought that was really important. It was important also to document it and learn from of it. So that's one of the reasons I wrote this book. So let's start with the presentation. The way I organize the presentation, I'm gonna cover three topic areas. The first one is emerging new geographics and, and looking at the statistics and demographics changes that are taking place across the country. The second one, I'll focus on what is called the power of place in neighbor selection. I will provide an overview of why Latinos tend to gravitate to specific areas and different urban centers. In the last part, placemaking and Latino communities, I'll provide some recommendations and based on the case studies that I covered before and some of the learning lessons that can be applied to other communities. So like I said, given the constraints of the time, I'm just gonna provide an overview of some of these practices and I'll try to provide as much as possible with illustrate with examples. So the first section is looking at the emerging urban geographies. The idea here, why it's important that we focus on the demographic changes that are taking place in the country, because the Latinos are contributing to revitalization of urban places and the demographic changes are important, they're foundation for this research. For example, there are some debates about whether we call this group Latinos, Hispanics or Latinx, so uh, there's a, there was a survey that showed pretty much of those who were surveyed that 30% of the people who were surveyed that would prefer the term Latino, Hispanic, 14% they prefer the term Latino and 50% and pretty much it doesn't make any difference. Also the Gallup found, found a survey more recently that 4% 4, 4 of the Latino or Hispanic Americans prefer the Latinx, the term Latinx this is a more gender neutral term that is gaining popularity. But first, I would like to talk about and cover some of the myths and stereoty stereotypes of Latinos. I mean, first, they say all Latinos look the same. That's not real, actually. If you look at this image that it has a group of, I mean, famous people that are Latinos on the Latino background, they're not, they don't look the same. Also, they say that all Latinos speak Spanish. That's not true. There are Latinos who only speak English. Some of them speak English and Spanish. And they also, there are also those who speak only Spanish. Also, they, the idea that Latinos only live in Miami and Los Angeles and New York is not true. Re recent surveys and the census have shown they're moving to other areas of the country. So these are some of the things I would like to highlight. And this image, I know it's kind of, there are too many numbers here, but the, the main things that we need to take away from this, this is from the census 2020. Here the Latin shows that the Latinos is 62 million of the entire population. So we are about 18.7% of the total population. There has been an increase of 75% from 2000 to 2020. And what's most important of this, as the, the, the census is, it shows the new growth areas, the new destinations for Latinos that are not in the Southwest or in the Northeast. Latinos are moving to new destinations, mainly in the Southwest, I mean, mainly in the South, in the Midwest, there are some counties in the Midwest where the Latino population grew 500 to 70 percent. And some states reported if they wouldn't include the growth of Latino population, they will have negative growth. So this is important to take advantage and take into consideration as we plan and design in design our cities, plan and design for new population. Also, it's important to highlight that most of this growth is for those Latinos who are already in the country. They're not for new immigrants, they're for the, from those who are here from their second and third generation. If we look at the demographics in your area, in your metropolitan area, we see the Benton County and Washington County that are pretty much parallel to the demographic things, changes are taking place at the, in the countries, about 18% on both counties. Compared to what we have here in Columbus, it's a metropolitan area. Columbus, Ohio is a metropolitan area where, where we have about 2 million people and the percentage of Latinos is only 5.8%. So pretty much what you have is pretty much relevant to what's happening around the country. So this is all I wanted to say here in terms of demographics. I know I could spend hours talking about this one, 
this topic, but the idea is to kind of highlight the demographic changes that are taking place in our country and take those into consideration as we plan and design our cities and neighborhoods. The second area we'd like to cover is what is called the neighborhood, the power of place on neighborhood selection. The idea is to try to understand why Latinos move to specific areas of the country and what are the reasons that help to trap those communities. So first, what is Latin urbanism? If you look at the definition of Latin urbanism and placemaking, it's an emerging approach to planning, design, and development that responds to the Latino lifestyles and cultural preference and economic needs and is reflected in the built environment. And it's important to clarify, I'm not talking about Latin American urbanism, I'm talking about the urbanism that immigrants bring to the United States and how they reflect this, how this is reflecting the lifestyles in the way they revitalize their neighborhoods. For instance, studies have shown that Latinos bring the aspects of the culture, the, the social life, the gatherings, the social life is really important. It's part of the DNA of the Latin American culture, the people from Latin America. And that's one of the things they bring to the United States and help to revitalize their neighborhoods. So our cities have been going through what is called the urban cycles where there's new construction, abandonment, recycle, demolition, and new construction. And when Latinos come to these urban areas, mainly in suburban areas and second ring cities, I mean, they start what is called the recycle process. We, we, we have seen many buildings and structures that been converted from gas stations to movie theaters to businesses by local entrepreneurship from the, local, the Latino community. But why do they move this in some specific areas? Studies have shown that the presence of social networks and social capital are really important for Latinos and new immigrants and neighborhoods because they act as buffers in new areas. They provide social support, for example, if they need access to medical services, social services. They go to these community anchors for help and support. And also these community anchors are the source of information for referrals. If they need to find a job or find housing to rent, that's where they go. Most of these anchors usually tend to be nonprofit organizations and in many cases, local churches. They provide these services to new immigrants. This is an example from the case studies that I have done. This is from the West Bigley Corridor in Detroit, Michigan. And I wanted to analyze what the presence of community anchors in the neighborhood. And the main community anchors in this neighborhood were the school, the churches, community services, parks and open spaces, and convenience store. This area was rich in terms of community anchors because the presence of these community anchors helped to stabilize the community in the area and provide and help in the simulation process. Not every city, not every neighborhood has all these community anchors. Some, in some areas, you only have a school or a church, but in places like Detroit, they're able to have so many community anchors. Also, within the last few years, there has been a theory that's called hetero, heterolocalism. It's pretty much referred that nowadays, Latino or any group of immigrants, they don't have to relocate or settle themselves in what is considered ethnic enclaves. They can be in different areas in, in the city, in different parts of the metropolitan area, and they still be connected to each other through social media, community anchors, and tele telecommunications. This is what, like I said, this is what is called heterolocalism. They can be connected to social media and community anchors. If you see the image, the image here on the top is from Phoenix area. It shows the Latinos are in one area that are located and concentrating in a specific area in, La in Phoenix metro area, they're spread out through the city. So also, and the other image it shows, this one, it shows pretty much how Latinos tend to use social media at a higher rate than the rest of the pop population. The idea for this is they need to be connected with their families back in the home country or in other parts of the city. So not only community anchors are important, we need to have what is called third places. According to Ray Oldenburg, the, he argues that in order to have success on communities, we need to have first place, the home, the second place is work, and the third places, those are the informal places 
where we tend to connect with the so in social life with our friends and unwind. These are important for communities to thrive. And in many Latino communities, the third places usually tend to be the baker store, the barber shop, or the coffee shop. So that's why those are the third places that help to restabilize the community. And there's a tremendous need for this type of third places in our cities. And this can be implemented and supported to planning policies that sustain and encourage this type of businesses in there and in our neighborhoods. So the third area that we'll cover is pretty much about placemaking in Latino communities. And I will show some of the principles from all case studies, but keep in mind the idea here is not to copy and paste all these strategies. The, the, the main object is here is to think, start thinking in terms of how can we, aspects of transferability, how can we transfer some of the key ideas from these projects into our areas, given what we have. We have a lot of our own government, our own culture, all places are different. So think about the uniqueness of your community and how can we stabilize, how can we introduce, introduce or, or in support some of these strategies when we were thinking about the locality. Based on the case studies that have done in the past, there are three lessons that I learned, three things that I can think about it. The first one, the main idea here is that we, plan, we, learn, we have learned that prescriptive planning, top-down design system do not always yield to positive outcomes. We need to think in more innovative ways that reflect the changes that are taking place in our communities. The first, the first concept will be pretty much start thinking about the qualities, what make places you need, what are the set of conditions that make your community special, and for this thing, for this aspect, I will start thinking about culture, the person of social networks, the community that's exterior on your neighborhoods. The second recommendation or the thing that we need to think about is about the interventions. What are the interventions that need to, that need to be in place in order to make faster, stabilize the community and create tax base? So when you start thinking about how can we support our communities, what sort of infrastructure support we need to provide to our communities for those who are interested in establishing new businesses, new ventures, and start providing support, guidance for local businesses, provide community navigators. Those are really, really important to show this, um, this business people who want to start business, where are all these resources available for their community, for their enterprises. And there, I think was really important when we start thinking about the built environment, we need to think about the aspects of design and architecture that need to be addressed in order to create more responsive and inclusive environments. Start thinking about providing guidelines that reflect like the, the changes are taking place in our community. So these are the three main lessons I will give in terms of how to start thinking about Latino urbanism, Latino placemaking. Now I'm gonna show you some examples based on the case studies that I done throughout the country. Like I said, the first thing is capitalize on destinations and attractions and celebrate the local ethnic entrepreneurial spirit of our communities. We need to start thinking about what makes our community unique is the businesses, the things that represent people from other cultures. And we start thinking about, this is the, the West Vernon Corridor in Southwest Detroit. What makes this place so unique, some of the qualities of this space is not the surrounding area. If you see this area is surrounded pretty much by industry, the downtown Detroit, Mexican town, pretty much is an island surrounded by heavy industry. But what makes this place so unique is the present or Latino business, that minority owned business in the area. And these numbers are pre-pandemic in the area there were about 1700 business in the area about 16 square miles. This included 140 restaurants, 30 bakeries, 25 grocers, and specialty shops. And what's most important of this is that Latinos, they own about, they run about 85% of this business in the area. So this is what makes this area unique. So the residents in the area, the leadership in the city, they capitalize on this in order to create guidelines that represent the community. Another example, this is not included in the book, but I've been working for the last few months is in 
in Cleveland is what is called the Clark Fulton Villa Span in Cleveland. And this neighborhood actually, they wanted to capitalize and take advantage and, and show who are the residents who live there. So they focus on the qualities that make this place so, so unique. So they decided to put some murals, kind of improve the quality of life, the streets, they provided banners with flags from the, that represent people who live there. But the idea was to highlight the qualities of this place through infrastructure. As you can see, very simple strategies by providing murals, providing safer walks, sidewalks, that made a great improvement in the area. Another example, like I said earlier, this is what is called Mexican town. It's an area that's filled with restaurants, Mexicans and a lots of businesses owned by local residents. So it's become an attraction. According to the Chamber of Commerce from the city of Detroit, this area is one of the most walkable areas in the city. And the reason for that is all the business in the areas, they generate pedestrian activities actually, they make this a very vibrant community. So the idea, this is one of the assets. So they needed to capitalize what's already there. So based on that, not only capitalizing on the assets in the area, cities and city officials and neighborhood leaders, they need to start thinking about how to capture and how to connect with the community and develop this, this neighborhood studies that actually represent the local community. What they did here, the way they did here, the leadership got together and created a vision and exercise with the local residents. It's really important that make the residents have to be part of the, the planning and design process through a different outreach and engagement activities they were able to capitalize and focus on the needs and concerns of the local residents. So this is a, an example of one of the reports that was generated through with input from the local residents and community leaders. There are different approaches how to connect with the local communities in order to learn and learn about the needs and concerns. We need to learn to listen, to ask the questions and make them part of the design process. In many communities, sometimes the cities don't have the right staff or don't have the resources to focus on outreach and engagement activities. So another opportunity for this is communities need to connect with local universities and neighborhood design centers. In many occasions, they provide this, this process as well, that they provide these services, the outreach and engagement, and they create a vision and exercise that can, they're able to reflect the needs and concerns of the community. I have done this on my urban design studios here in Columbus, Ohio. We go and do our recent engagement with local residents. My students put together this vision and exercise. And the idea is pretty much to learn about the needs and concerns of the residents and make them part of the design process. So wherever this whatever design proposals we come up with, that's to be informed by what we need, what we hear from the residents. So this is really important. Equally, we need to start thinking about providing capacity building for our residents. If there is a large entrepreneurial speed in the community, we need to have in place a infrastructure support that encourage and support this type of businesses. A really good example for this is, again, this is in Columbus, Ohio, in, Co in Cleveland, Ohio. This is the Chamber, Chamber, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but again, not every city, not every community is able to have a Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but in addition, they can have community leaders, city officials, nonprofit organizations, and very active residents and they can take the leadership in, in this process. What I want to highlight here, these are images from the website from the Northeast Hispanic organizations in Cleveland, Ohio. What they did here, this non Hispanic Chamber of Commerce were able to focus in two specific areas. The first one is the, the business center. Here is somebody wants to start a new business. They come to the business center and they're able to get all the support and information needed, needed to start a new business. Also the training in terms of how to do all the permits that require and things like that. People get training and are able to focus and start the new businesses. And the other aspect was what is called the community development. The, the community development area was pretty much 
to find a specific projects where they can target and focus all their energy. One thing that they did, they focused on three specific projects. The first one, what is called Last T and Vitas. This pretty much is part of an incubator that help these local residents who want to start business in the area and they're not able to afford a rent. They created this business incubator, incubator to help them start these businesses, their own businesses. The second prey, what they, they, they focus is what is called La Placita Cleveland. This is pretty much an annual cultural festival that take place in the area. And the idea to have a major festival that showcase and highlight the cultural aspects of the community and also the, the businesses in the area. So they get to know who is in the area in terms of business and support. So they have this big cultural event in the city. And the third one is what is called La Villa Hispana. This pretty much is a target neighborhood. So what they wanted to do, have to create a placemaking there and provide identity to placemaking. This is what is this called La Villa Hispana. This is a target area for development and investment. This pretty much the heart of the city. So all the investment is taking place in this area. And the four, and this pretty much the crown jewel of the projects in the Northeast Ohio Hispanic Center is Centro Villa 25. This is, my, this is a, an active reuse, a redevelopment project of a warehouse actually is gonna provide a place where we have all these businesses in the area. It's gonna be a mixed use development. Again, like I said, it's part of a actor reuse development of former warehouse and it's gonna be probably implemented in the next few years. They already got the permits, they have all the business lined up. So this is gonna be the crown jewel, jewel of the neighborhood. Think about a business center, mixed use development that focus on Latin entrepreneurial events. And also that we need to start thinking how to capitalize on non-core institutions in our neighborhood. This is also the role of those leaders in the community, either the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, or the people who are taking leadership in these communities. They need to start thinking about how can we capitalize on anchor, anchor institutions. Anchor institutions are these really large institutions that can help economically support their and provide resources in order to capitalize and help the process in the area. What they did here in Clark Fulton area, the Cleveland Museum established a what is called the Pivot Center. It's a center for art, dance, and expression. And it's also an incubator for local businesses. So they brought together all these businesses and also provide some services for the community and for the surrounding areas in order to bring more income to the area. So the benefits of providing this infrastructure and support for local business can, can revitalize the lapidated commercial corridor. This is an example from Columbus, Ohio. This is part of what is called the Westland Mall. This is a suburban mall that's been abandoned for the last 17 years. There's no business in the area. And they have this strip mall in front of it. It's been abandoned. So what they did, the city helped the local residents and the, the business, the Latino business to, put, to establish a new supermarket. It's called La Plaza Tapatia. So this supermarket actually helped to revitalize the area. This was a catalyst project. Not only this big supermarket was able to relocate in the area, but they also brought other smaller businesses in the area that helped to revitalize the area and provide some more income and tax revenue for the city. But also we need to start thinking in terms of the physical infrastructure, what are the aspects of urban design and architecture that need to be addressed in order to create more responsive and inclusive communities. So we need to capitalize on the local culture and represent those throughout the built environment and focus on the quality of all the public spaces as well. So again, this is, this, uh, this is a really good example where emphasis was put on the public space, on the sidewalks in the connectivity in the connectivity tissue of in the connected tissue of the community. So what they did here in order to revitalize the area, the first study was to focus on this in the outdoor environments. They provided safe, safe and wide sidewalks, lighting, all these factors contribute to the safe, 
to create safety places so people don't, they're not afraid to use these places. So they're always something happening in the street. So they focus on the infrastructure and through providing amenities and connectivity to the public transportation. This is a really good example. Also, some of the communities that are building that have been able to retrofit, some of these were, have been more successful than others. The reason some of the buildings have been, some buildings have been successful to provide, to convert into mixed-use development is because some of these were built and designed during the 1950s and 60s when the focus on human, the buildings were more at a human scale where they provide large windows in the, in the ground floor and that or possibilities to live on the second floor. So if you look at examples that are presented here in the image, this image are very successful. The reason because they're able to convert resi from residential uses to mixed use developments. They're able to establish their, their business in the ground floor and they're able to live in the second floor. And there are advantages to this strategy is that people can able to live where they work and they can save money from rent and transportation. This is something that should be encouraged in our communities. And this is something that these neighbors are doing really well. But also we need to start thinking about what makes good places, successful places, not only Latino communities, but in, in any community, it will start thinking about strategies that actually encourage access and linkages, uses and activities, comfort and images and sociability, those really important factors. Like I said, th those are the factors that are the key qualities that make su successful the rent spaces, not only in Latino communities, but in any community. And people tend to ask, well, what are the difference between sustainable urbanism and Latino urbanism? Well, it, it will look at some of the elements that make sustainable urbanisms include workability, the use of public transportation, access to commerce and fresh food, also access to biophilia of open spaces. All these elements are part of the Latino community already. They tend to establish themselves in, in places that are very walkable. The reason for that, many of them cannot afford a car, so they tend to put, establish themselves in areas where they have, they have really good access to jobs and public transportation. So there's no difference between sustainable urbanism and Latin urbanism. Some of the common principles are present in both of these areas. So walkability is a major factor on this community. It's central to the revitalization process of Latino communities. This is a connective tissue between the residents, the city and institutions. So they need to be present. These are examples from two case studies and the we have the West Bigley Corridor in the Clark Fulton area in Cleveland. Both of these communities, they put a strong emphasis on their walkability, making sure that people have access to this area. So this is a really good strategy that could be implemented in other Latino communities. Also the idea of having access to fresh food and, and products. Sometimes we don't think about the benefits of these supermarkets, Latino or any supermarkets in the area, and they have economic, social, and health benefits from this area. And most of these areas that are, where they are located they tend to be underserved communities. They don't have access to fresh food. So one of the benefits of having these supermarkets, studies have shown that th these are the only source to fresh food in meats in the area. So it's really important we support this community. This is pretty much the antidote to food deserts and help to have, like I said, have social benefits and health benefits in top of economic benefits. So that's why it's important we support this type of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial events. So overall, I think it's important to reflect on what are the implications for planning and career more walkable and livable communities. So overall, I always say we need to start focus on bottom up qualities and activities. Like I said, prescriptive planning is not producing or yielding good results. So we need to start thinking about what some of the efforts our local communities are actually implementing and being successfully create more livable and walkable communities. So we need to start thinking about what are the strengths of the community and try to capitalize on those 
the ministry to start thinking about capacity building, providing infrastructure support for our communities in all those entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurships they want to establish new business and area. That's important to think about that. And that other aspect is think about the physical environment, how to improve the quality of physical environment to urban design guidelines that allow for the expression of local residents. It needs to reflect who lives there, who works there. So there are many communities where the zoning and planning guidelines are outdated and they don't reflect the changes that are taking place on these communities. Like I said, the physical environment, they need to reflect who lives there. So in order to do this, we need to have leadership. This is really, really important. And there's no leadership, this will never happen. So it's important to start thinking in terms of leadership and visionaries. These are the people or the entities that will be able to bring together the anchor institutions, community members, stakeholders, and all the depart departmental agencies that are, committed, that are committed to community based vision and solutions. So, through leadership, to really good leadership, this is going to be able to happen. So, I think I went too fast. Maybe this is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions or comments? I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Lada. Um, there's so much information that you have already touched on that. I certainly see glimpses of throughout our communities here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I'm gonna have a couple of questions for you. I do encourage everyone uh, who has been listening to the presentation to please put your questions and comments in the chat feature or the Q&A feature. And uh, we certainly will get to those questions um, as we go along. But again, Dr. Lada, thank you for um, presenting all this information already. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions, maybe sure. to expound on what you've already presented. Uh, first of all, let me, again, another uh, suggestion I would have for everyone is to get a copy of Professor Lada's uh, book. Um, it's available both in electronic versions, but also in, pa in, in paper book uh, version. Uh, I would recommend the paper book version because you'll want to be able to take some notes and be able to go back and look at that as a resource. Um, Alex is holding up a copy there, great um, product model, uh, helping me out here, uh, but really do recommend the book. I had the privilege of reading through the book uh, in the past few days, and uh, one of the first questions I had for Dr. Lotta was, you know, these case studies were in larger metropolitan areas. I think it was uh, Columbus and Phoenix and the others, and uh, going back to the demographics first, I was I was surprised, Dr. Lada, to, to, to see that we percentage wise in Northwest Arkansas, at least in some of our communities, have a higher percentage of Latino population than even some of the case study areas. And so um, we certainly have opportunity, I think, as a result of that. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, I was surprised to see the percentage of your metropolitan area compared to what we have here in Columbus. But if you if you saw the map with all the new destinations for Latinos where they're moving across the country, your metropolitan area is one of the highest, is one of the dark blue areas. And actually, they tend to move to areas, I'm assuming the main reason they move to those areas is because the presence of jobs, there are family members who live there. There are people who have the, their own cultural background. And this is what is called chain migration. This is the reason people move to these new locations. So it's not the traditional destinations in the south, in Los Angeles, New York, Miami. So they're moving to other areas. And like you saw on the map, I mean, I, I was even surprised to see that most of the Latinos are moving to the south in the Midwest. And not only to metro, large metropolitan areas, they're moving into rural areas as well. For instance, here in Ohio, the largest population of Latinos are in the Northwest. It's pretty much a rural area close to Cleveland. And the reason they move there because we have all the meatpacking industry and the agricultural areas, there's, they, that's where they go because jobs are existing, they exist in their area, in those areas. 
that's great. And so we certainly have opportunity here just based upon our population to uh, take some of these learnings from other areas seriously. And Dr. Lotta was quick to say, this is not about copying what someone else has done, but it's really about taking the lessons learned from those other case studies and applying those to the uniqueness of our community. Um, Dr. Lara, I had the opportunity, the privilege really to live in Guadalajara, Mexico in your hometown uh, during my college years. And I loved that particular area. Uh, and one of the questions we have in the Q&A is about these third places, uh, these public places, uh, or those um, like the plazas, uh, parks that you, know, you are familiar with from being in Guadalajara, Mexico, and perhaps I also had an opportunity to, to, to see uh, during those years. We may have lost Dr. Lotta for a moment. Yeah, Alex, it looks like um, he dropped off. I know he said that he was having a few um, minor issues earlier for some unknown reasons. So let's give him just a minute. We'll um, give him a minute to rejoin. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And um, while we are waiting on him, just so you know, we do have the Q&A function. Um, and Alex, if you wanna go there next, um, you're welcome to just use those questions. Um, I'd say in order from the top down, uh, that'd be awesome. And then it looks like we also have a few questions in the chat box as well, so. And okay, I'll do, my, I'll do my best to um, get to those questions. We'll give Dr. Lotta a moment to, yeah. to um, hopefully rejoin us. Perfect. Yeah, we'll um, we'll give him just another minute. Thank you all for bearing with us. Of course, uh, these things tend to happen sometimes. So thank you so much for bearing with us as we figured out. Thank you. I would, I would draw everyone's attention, at least from, from what I read in this book, uh, just there are obviously very many parallels uh, between some of these case studies and what we see in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I was fascinated to see how he uh, described sustainable urbanism to Latino urbanism and really there being, I think he just said no difference between the two. It's certainly uh, a lot of similarities. And I know here in Northwest Arkansas, sustainability is just a huge uh, part of what we all try to be a part of. Um, and so I think there's some some wonderful lessons uh, to be learned there. Um, I'll keep talking. And hopefully he'll join us in a moment. But I love these these re what I what I picked out as the re words, the uh, revitalization, the re uh, adaptation, recycling. Again, uh, at least in my thinking, a lot of uh, sustainability type of concepts that uh, that we certainly have a a, a, a priority on uh, here in North Northwest Arkansas. Uh, another thing Dr. Lotta touched on, uh, hopefully that you were able to pick up, is um, entrepreneurial entrepreneurialism. And I know that we have some organizations here in Northwest Arkansas who are already doing a great job at uh, encouraging and helping with entrepreneurship. Um, and um, I believe there's some, uh, certainly some terrific tie-ins between uh, the information, the research, the case studies that Dr. Lada has provided, and much of what you saw today, and the entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem here in Northwest Arkansas. And so uh, if you, when, I'm not gonna say if, but when you get a copy of the book, I would suggest that uh, that would be an area of focus. And thank goodness, Dr. Lada appears to be rejoining us. Uh, let's see if, uh, there he is, oh, briefly. All right. Back online. Dr. Lada, we lost you there for a moment. Welcome back. I got disconnected, sorry. sorry no, me. no problem. And uh, I did my best to keep uh, the conversation moving a little bit, at least with my uh, reflections on your book. Uh, I just, just briefly, I mentioned uh, the, the, um, the sustainable uh, urbanism and the likeness it has to Latino urbanism, just touched on that. And then also the importance of how uh, Latino urbanism can be a, a vehicle for uh, entrepreneurship and encouraging entrepreneurship. And those are both areas 
that we have strong emphasis on here in Northwest Arkansas. But I think when you when you when you when you uh, got disconnected from us, I was mentioning Guadalajara, Mexico, and the privilege I had to be there part of one summer. Uh, you're from there. Uh, I remember the great parks and plazas uh, that are a part of that city. And um, one of the questions we had in our Q and A was, uh, are these third places like the plazas we might see in Mexico, uh, and how how do those play a, a role in this Latino urbanism? So, so what happened here, most of these Latino immigrants, they moved to suburban neighborhoods where there's no plazas, the areas are not very walkable. So that's what they need when they, create, they establish their own businesses, that's they use their businesses and the sidewalks at the plazas. Since they don't have plazas in this area, the outdoor amenities become the, 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 their, their plazas. So for example, you, you go to a Latino neighborhood and you're dressed in your city and your neighborhood, you can see, look at the businesses, the signers, they bring the, the business outside to the sidewalk. Sometimes the products, the things that they sell. So that's how this inactive environment, this inactive environment, they, since they don't have plazas and public spaces that they're in Latin America, they need to accommodate and be more flexible and transform the, whatever they have here. In these cases, most of these cases, the suburban environment. Okay, wonderful. Uh, another, another thing I mentioned while you were away for a moment is how I love these, what I call the rewords, the revitalization, readaptation, recycle. And it sounds like this plaza, uh, there's a, there's a readaptation of the spaces that are available to serve that uh, social space that's needed amongst these communities. Uh, let me uh, get to a second question here. Uh, what, what does proper, property ownership look like in some of these case study neighborhoods? Um, to what extent have there been opportunities for Hispanic, Latino uh, communities to build wealth? Uh, have community development corporations played an important role? So in terms of ownerships, like I said, one of the main reasons Latino immigrants have moved to these areas because they're affordable rents. And for more, most, more, most immigrants, especially from Latin America, the, the most important thing is to buy a home. Once they move to a different, once they come to this country and they buy a home, that they think that we finally make it, made it. So for them, this is really important having ownership. If you look at the statistics across the country in terms of home ownership, home ownership is pretty much driven by the Latino community, Latino population. In most of these areas where they have their business, like I said, they move there because they're affordable rents, they have access to public transportation. So the chances of being able to own their own house, their own business are much higher, especially if they have all this infrastructure support. One thing that I noticed throughout the case studies, those communities where the Latino presence has been the longest, they're able to capitalize on that. They have more infrastructure. That was the case of in Detroit, Indianapolis and Cleveland, where Latinos have been there longer than any other areas. And Columbus is considered a new destination. So the presence of support network is not there. So the, the, the idea, a sense of ownership and the ability to buy their homes is not as high as it is in other areas. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, we have another question that I believe is somewhat related. Um, have you seen any, any cities uh, handle the problem of vacant buildings or absent landlords uh, particularly well. Uh, we have a lot of, quote, holding, end quote, by developers here uh, that ultimately drags down some of the potential of our Latino commercial areas. Mm -hmm. So um, vacant buildings, uh, developers holding onto properties, how can we work out of some of that? Uh, have, you, have you seen some cities help with those challenges? So one thing that I noticed in the Detroit case study, like I said, is located in one of the very industrial areas, pretty much an island or residence surrounded by all this industry. And in the, in the proper, I mean, the vacancy rates are much lower in this neighborhood than the rest of Detroit. The reason for that is that Latinos are able to buy their own homes, keep up the, their, their houses, the maintenance, 
and this adds to the quality of bioresiness. Just walking to this area, driving around the, 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 this corridor, you can see the difference where the Latinos are located. Usually the vacancy rates are much, much lower and the maintenance and upkeep of their homes are much, much higher. So this has to be with how easy it is for them to buy a home or house and establish all these entities. And this has to be worked with nonprofit organization and city officials. They take the lead, they need to take the leadership on that if they want to keep the vacancy rates low. Okay, all right. Well, we're getting several questions, so I'm just going to keep asking sure. and uh, yeah. having you uh, reflect on these from your experience and, and uh, expertise. Um, another question: There has been some discussion in Northwest Arkansas around multi generational living and how to accommodate this perceived preference with housing design. Uh, based on your research and experience, do you think that multi-generational living is based on cultural preference or economic necessity? It's based on cultural preference. If you look at the race of multi-generational homes, the Latinos are much higher. It's part of our culture. It's not by economics. It's part of our culture. And it's something that is beneficial. We need to encourage that. In many cities, for example, in California, they have what is called granny homes. They're able to convert the garages is on the back of the house for small units for either for grandparents. And also here in Columbus and Ohio, we have something similar. Actually, we need to encourage that. that that's really important. It's part of the culture, like I said. The zoning goes and needs to reflect the demographic changes taking place. If the Latino co community, Latino, the Hispanics tend to live in multi-generational homes, this is something that has to be supported and encouraged through zoning and other regulations that facilitate the process. Okay, oh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Lara, another thing I was thinking about uh, as I was reading through your book and then uh, when we, we're able to visit briefly is, uh, we're obviously focused on Latino urbanism, uh, these uh, uh, urban areas with a high uh, Latino population uh, density. Um, and I can certainly think of areas in our communities that reflect those types of attributes. Um, but this isn't really just about those Latino urban areas. This is about uh, really the entire community uh, elevating the entire community as a result of paying attention to and enabling this Latino urbanism. Um, so how do we engage community members who may see this as sort of a Latino urban uh, opportunity, but not necessarily a, a overall community opportunity? How do we engage community members who may not be currently connected in this thinking and process? So one thing that I always very support is about outreach and engagement activities. As an academic, that's what I do with my students. When we work with underserved communities, the idea is to, we need to connect with the communities to try to understand. The first thing is try to immerse in the community as much as possible. Learn who lives there, ask questions, observe, observe, and observe. Other questions in order to learn who lives there and provide the right solutions. Our reach and engagement is a really important one. One really good possibility is to the vision and exercise where you meet with your local residents and think about and find out and do surveys of what are the things that make they like about their community and one things that they dislike about their community. So that way you can able to tackle the area that, that have issues with. So that's how you learn about who lives there, what are the issues, is through outreach and engagement and vision and exercises. It's not only for Latino communities. I have worked in underserved communities where it's a mix of residents, Latino, African-Americans, and white. And, and the idea is to provide support across the different races, different groups, but focus on the built environment, thinking about the quality of urban spaces. Having background in landscape architecture and urban design, I always emphasize that good quality of public spaces really help to revitalize places. Like I said, we need to think about what makes places good and specifics in terms of accessing linkages, different, different uses and services, and provides the sociability of these places. 
like I said, this is not endemic to the Latino communities for anyone who wants to create really, really good and successful diverse places. Okay, wonderful. So if I'm understood, understanding correctly, this just has, this is not just about um, uh, cultural understanding and awareness and involvement and engagement, but uh, there's certainly an, an economic element to it as well when you talk about underserved communities overall, which again, uh, in my thinking at least, would impact our overall uh, cities and, and towns as you pay attention to those areas. Um, um, so um, just I think it's just so important to know that uh, this this is something that everyone hopefully would be participating in and that that engagement would be across the board uh, throughout our communities. And also um, what's really important is to have the city official and policy makers in place because if, if you come out as a community group with a really good plan, a really good vision exercise or how, or how to guide growth and development in your community, that's not enough. You need to have the infrastructure support and policy that's going to be able to implement those guidelines that you put together with the community. So that's why it's really important that the leadership and officials and policy makers are on board with the process. Otherwise, nothing will happen. So you come with a really good plan, you need to have infrastructure support to implement it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, here's a, here's a good question. I have a partial answer and then Dr. Lara, if you have something to add. Um, if we wanted to research more about opportunities to be involved in Latino placemaking in Northwest Arkansas, where would you suggest we start? I would say, first of all, get Dr. Lada's book because there are some terrific uh, learnings and lessons uh, that uh, could, I believe, uh, pretty readily be applied to Northwest Arkansas. Um, besides these case studies, Dr. Lada, um, any other opportunities to learn about Latino placemaking that uh, that you would, would suggest to us? Well, definitely. This is a large and growing field in the last 20, field of research area in the last 25, 30 years. And there's a different authors that are contributing to the growth of this field. In addition, if you want to learn more Latino urbanism, there is the American Planning Association has a chapter on Latino planners. Actually, I don't know you have one in Arkansas, but there is the, the, the national as the National American Planning Association has a whole chapter on Latino planning with different resources. You can reach up to that. I mean, also some of the local chapters of Urban Land Institute there have a specific areas that focus on Latino urbanism as well. It's not it's not a distinction between Latin urbanism or placemaking. The idea here is to focus on the qualities that make places so unique and reflects what, who lives there, who works there. And so that, that, that is a more inclusive process of planning and design. Okay, all right. Yeah, and I should have mentioned also ULI as a wonderful resource for education about urban uh, planning. Um, here's another question, uh, somewhat related, obviously. Um, some cities in Northwest Arkansas limit the number of unrelated persons living in a single family residential house. However, people who are, quote, like family, end quote, may want to live together in predominantly Latino, Latina X communities. Do you know of any communities that have contended with this kind of use limitation? And let's see, let me get the rest of the question. Um, let me just stop there. Any, any communities have contended with that specific kind of use or residential makeup uh, limitation or ordinance? Unfortunately, I haven't come across any case study that actually deals with the issue, but actually this is a big problem. Like I said, there are benefits of having intergenerational homes and those should be encouraged. And that, but that's something that city officials and the local governments need to deal with. But again, if this is a trend that actually is happening in communities, why discourage this type of housing? There's a way to encourage this and be able to do it the right way. But this has to come from the city officials and the policy makers. And unfortunately, I haven't come across any case study that deals with this, this issue so far. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, Alex uh, Howland, um, I've done my best to 
get through some of the questions that were in the Q&A and the comments. If you see any I have missed and want to bring those to Dr. Lada's attention, I welcome you to do so. Absolutely. I was just double checking and to my knowledge, I believe that you answered every single one of them. So thank you both so much for such an engaging and truly informative um, just session here. This is this is fantastic. Um, and also just for anyone who is still with us, uh, there are several resources that have been dropped into the chat box. So please feel free to grab those links, grab those resources, um, share them out with your communities. Arkansas.uli.org is another great resource. Uh, you know, we are doing our best to host more conversations like this. Um, we're doing our best to really bring uh, these into the spotlight where maybe they, they haven't been so far. So uh, we really, really just appreciate that. Um, any other questions? This is kind of your last chance. You can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. You can drop it into the chat box or the Q&A feature. We'll give just one minute to, um, to give you all the opportunity to do that. But thank you so much for all of the really great questions, first of all. Um, really just super like enlightening and, and so good for us to hear these things. So really appreciate that. And if there are no more questions, um, I would just I have, love to... Oh, go ahead. I have one final question for, for Dr. Lada. Um, again, I was encouraged so much, Dr. Lada, to read your book. Uh, to see uh, so many of these um, uh, elements uh, within our Northwest Arkansas communities, and uh, hope that we can hope that we can uh, take some of the lessons learned from your uh, research and work and apply those to our community. Um, from from having looked at these uh, other cities, these case studies you know, over the period of time, and just reflecting on that, uh, what what hope can you uh, help us see if we are to if we if we jump in and we engage in this type of a learning and application process of the lessons learned from these case studies and apply those to Northwest Arkansas. What what hope can we see for our community moving forward? Again, not just the Latino community, but our community at large. So the idea here is to encourage entrepreneurial businesses. It doesn't have to be just Latinos. If somebody wants to establish their own businesses, provide the necessary resources, infrastructure support to start, to start their own businesses. That's gonna help to stabilize the communities, bring source of income for cities, and they'll be able to come destinations. But also they need to capitalize on the qualities of characteristics that are present in your community. Like I said, every case study, every city is different. So not, not every city is able to afford a chamber Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, or, but they need people like you, Alex, that are leaders in the community that can be able to connect all these different key players and stakeholders and community anchors to make it happen. Like I said, if there's no leadership, this won't happen. So when everything starts with the leadership more than anything else, usually community members or residents in the area, they need to take the leadership to make these things happen. And I think that's important. So that's the only way this strategy we're gonna be implemented and we're gonna be able to create a very livable and walkable and sustainable communities in general. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Lada, so much for uh, providing all the helpful information. Alex Howland, I'll turn it back over to you and um, go from 